everybody. It's not often I can say this, but what I'm driving today, I believe to be a world exclusive first drive on YouTube. And that's particularly remarkable because the car we are discussing came out 33 years ago. What is it? Well, it is that most unlikely of special editions, the Fiat Panda Italia 90. So then, before we get on to the specifics of the Italia 90, let's take a moment to talk about the Panda itself, because I think it's a rather remarkable car. It debuted in 1979, going on sale in Italy the year after, and then finally landing in Britain in 1981. It replaced the Fiat 126, and the design brief for it was that essentially it were to improve on its predecessor, but not cost any more. And for this project, Fiat handed the reins over to the newly formed Ital Design, where Giorgetto Giugiaro, legendary stylist, took care of the design work, and Aldo Montavani took care of the mechanicals and packaging. What came out of this was a masterclass in simplicity, and I think the Panda really deserves to be mentioned alongside such greats as the original Mini, the Citroen 2CV, the VW Beetle, and of course other stuff like the Renault 4, from which it allegedly drew inspiration. In other words, this was the sort of car that anybody could own and do almost anything with. It probably helped that over its life, it also saw an incredible number of variants, including both petrol, diesel, and even electric versions as well. There was also the mighty Panda 4x4, a bit of a cult hero, and a car that with some luck I will soon be featuring. Though the design was fundamentally simple, the car does feature a number of innovations aimed at making it not just easier to build, but also to live with. The overall dimensions are still fairly compact, the car clearly being aimed at either the urban or country user. Once you get it up to speed, it becomes a fairly noisy affair, and on the motorway, I'm told, it's a thoroughly unpleasant experience. This, though, I think, is not really a problem, because simply put, the motorway is not where this car was designed to spend its time. Instead, it was built for the narrow streets of Italian cities, and likely for those in rural areas that needed simple, cheap transport. The interior is simple but functional, but does still feature a few little storage bins, even though this one does kind of cut into my right leg, and the seats are pretty clever too. They may look fairly simple, however, the front ones tilt forward for easy access to the rear, and should you need it, both the front and rear seats will fold flat, giving you effectively a double bed. The controls behind the wheel are all basic, and other than the fact that the indicators are a little close, so your instinct is to go for the lights instead, they're perfectly fine. They work. The car also saw the introduction of an all-new engine, codenamed Fire. And that's notable because today, the Fire engine, or a variant of it, is still in use in the modern-day 500. In 1986, the model was facelifted into what's called either the Series or Mark II, and this incredibly remained in production until 2003, when it finally retired after 23 years of service and four and a half million units having been sold. But two decades on from its retirement, and the Panda is now sadly a very rare sight on the roads of Britain, likely due to a combination of people just not caring about cheap cars, the scrappage scheme we had back in 2008, and these doing a fairly good job of rusting and costing so much it just wasn't worth keeping them going. Have you got your heart set on a classic hatchback? Maybe you're thinking of importing one. Well, before you go to the classifieds, don't forget to take Car Vertical with you. The super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases from around the globe to give you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase. From accident damage, regardless of write-off status or not, outstanding finance, usage as a taxi, fire, theft, and even common issues like MOT failure points. A car vertical search takes just 60 seconds and can be done with either a registration plate or a VIN. Best of all, for 10% off the service, don't forget to use my discount code, which is JM.
So then, the Italia 90, what's that all about? Well, this was a special edition designed to commemorate, I'm sure you've guessed it, the 1990 Football World Cup, being hosted by Italy and sponsored by Fiat. A great number of these cars were produced and they featured prominently at many games, with a few convertible versions being made and then gifted to some of Italy's favourite players afterwards. I keep going for a fifth that doesn't exist, just the four speeds in this gearbox, and it defaults to sitting between third and fourth. That's my bad. Anyway, mechanically, this car is based on the entry-level Panda 750L, which means in terms of luxury, you don't get any. No electric windows, you certainly don't have air conditioning, you don't have power steering, nor by default did you even get a radio, or in fact, a parcel shelf. These really were very simple cars, but priced accordingly at £4,295. The plan was originally to sell 500 of them to UK buyers, with a number also going to people over in Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, but I'm told definitely not France. In other markets you could have had this car with different trim and engine combinations, but here they were all based on that 750L, so essentially every single one of them was the same. Visually, they were also all identical, featuring this white paintwork with an Italian tricolore down the side, finishing with the Italian 90 graphics. You also have Chow, the mascot from the competition, being featured prominently both outside and in. At the front, you have a badge denoting this is an Italian 90 special edition, and perhaps the most distinctive and memorable bit of the car, the hubcaps that look like footballs. <laughs> I really, really would love to know who would look at one of these and go, yeah, yeah, I'm going to buy that, not thinking that in a couple of months, as it happened, England would naturally get knocked out of the competition and then any and all excitement regarding the football would have dissipated. This being said, they did still manage to shift quite a few of them. However, a large number also hung around in dealerships until it got to the point where some of them tried to mask the fact it was an Italia 90 by removing the hubcaps and potentially some of the other decoration too. This one, I am delighted to say, has been brought to me by a lovely chap called John and is just about as original as one is ever going to get. It currently has 46,000 miles on the clock, having had just 18,000 put on by its first owner, who kept it from new until 2010. She apparently just drove it to the shops and back once a week, but the second owner then bought it and piled the miles on, not really caring for it until, perhaps fortunately, the fuel pump gave out, so he decided to store it in a shed where it languished for a few years until John then could purchase it and restore it to its sort of, well, former glory. He then has done what I think is the only sensible thing by decorating the car with a number of period-themed football and Fiat-related items. From the little Italian 90 ball that he has down here, to an old Fiat umbrella, the obligatory Panda soft toy, and even an Italian 90 can of Coke. This matches the soccer ball duffel bag that he's got, and even a game of Subutio that sits in the boot. I've got to say, I really admire that man's commitment to the cause. The interior, I am sure you will have noticed, is essentially standard, other than the fact it is in this particular blue, designed to mimic the shade that the Italian team were playing in. Though still mechanically identical to all other Panda 750Ls, by virtue of being a Series 2 car, it does at least feature all the upgrades that those got. So this 750 is in fact an improvement over the original engine, which displaced just 652cc. In fairness, this one is actually 769. And honestly, when you've got so few CCs, I'd be telling people about every single one of them. I'll tell you one thing that does confuse me though. I'm not exactly sure why they've used recycled petrol cans for the air filter. Regardless, even this larger and improved engine is still not overflowing with power. So though the car weighs just some 700 kilos or so, it also has just the 34 horsepower. Yeah, I think this might be the least powerful car that I've driven all year. In fact, on the channel, I think the only thing that could have less would be the Isetta bubble car. Hmm.
It does, though, to its credit, do a fairly reasonable job of getting up to about sort of 50 mile an hour. And 50 to 55 is clearly its happy place. Once you've got to 60, it becomes a very, very cantankerous old thing. And what really annoys me most, to be honest, is the ridiculous amount of both wind and tyre noise. There's little, I think, to probably no insulation in this car. And I've got to say, there's something nice about driving stuff like this, because having recently experienced the Dacia Sandero, it reminds me of just how far basic entry-level cars have come. I mean, this is all exposed bodywork and, well, four speeds, and it's got an ashtray, I suppose, which actually articulates, it's a bit weird. But one of my favorite things about a car like this is the fact that invariably they all come with a story. And this, I'm happy to say, is no exception. It began way back, as you might imagine, in 1990, when a then young John noticed that his biology teacher, Mrs. Pluck, bought one. And of course, this is the sort of car that everybody is going to notice, especially fairly mean young children. John was always a fairly car-obsessed type, though his peers often mocked him for it, particularly when he appeared on The Big Breakfast in 1995, as part of their young fogey section when he described his obsession with the Morris Minor. By this point in time, Mrs Pluck had moved on from her Italia 90, but still she summoned him into her office, and he was rather concerned about what exactly it was she had to say. As it turned out, she said to him, you're a sort of car person, aren't you? I've got these, and handed him the four original hubcaps from her Italia 90, which, possibly sensibly, she'd asked the dealership to remove because she did worry what exactly was going to happen to a car that had football hubcaps at an all-boys school. The car then being long gone and not knowing what to do with them, she gifted them to John, who then said, one day I will buy the car to put these on. Fast forward about 20 years and he managed to make the dream come true. Though as it happened, this came with its original hubcaps, so he still got those gifted to him, sealed in a bag for safekeeping. Knowing they were already a fairly rare car, and now even rarer than 25 years had passed, John then took it upon himself to start a register of Italia 90s, trying to track down just how many were left and where they were. Of the 450 that we believe were sold in Britain, to date only nine are known to be remaining, not all of which are in excellent condition and not all of which are currently on the road. This one, he says, is likely one of the better ones out there, and aside from an iffy little bit of paintwork front and rear, it is in, actually, fairly remarkable condition. He is something of an avid collector of cars, having, I'm told, 57 of them, all of this sort of ilk, weird, oddball, cool little stuff that he just found himself fascinated by. Currently, he's on a sort of bit of a British Leyland fest, and uh, though I think he is a, a little bit strange for that, I do also admire him because there just aren't that many people out there saving cars like this. All told, John has now managed to track down about 43 of these, and though I'd love to tell you exactly what one is worth, unsurprisingly, there weren't any for sale, so I just don't know. And I suspect it's the sort of car that to most people doesn't really mean anything. You may as well just buy a regular Panda. However, even those now are seriously rare. And in fact, this morning when I checked Auto Trader, there weren't really any old pandas of this ilk at all. That's a shame. They are out there. I mean, they made four and a half million of them. But still, for a car that was made in such great numbers, relatively few remain. So, what's it like to drive? Well, rackets aside, above about 30 mile an hour, it's fairly pleasant. The unassisted steering is very light, even at car park speed. All of the controls are nice and easy. The pedals have got a fair bit of distance between them, so you could drive this in wellies if you wanted. The four-speed gearbox is fairly cooperative, though it's worth noting first does not have a synchro mesh, and fourth can be a little bit tricksy. You've got to get the shift from third into it right, otherwise it just won't go, and I've had that happen a couple of times. Visibility, naturally, is excellent because the pillars are paper thin and there's a lot of glass in this cabin. It's a tiny little thing, so you've got a huge choice of whatever line you take through a corner, and the steering does give you a, a fair bit of feel. It's actually a, a little quicker than you might expect too, and look at this, you can just feed the car through. I mean, it's wonderful. Let's test the cornering ability, shall we? Pedals are a little bit too far away for heel and tar, unfortunately. 
brakes are a little bit worrying. They take a lot of force and don't really give you much stopping power. All right, let's chuck it around a bend. Grip is actually quite good. This is a laugh. Come on. I have been told you do have to drive it like a bit of a thug. I keep going for what really would be fifth. I'm moving the gear lever too much. That's my fault. All right, there's 40 mile an hour. We're in third still. 44, 46. I've got to change that, that's cruel. There's, there's 48, oh no, Laurie's pulled out in front of me and I definitely can't get past him. Now oh, we'll back off. It's fun, I wouldn't live with one. I mean, I think you'd get a little bit irked with it and um, it does feel like if you hit it with something, it would just crumple. However, I kind of admire it. I also think it's a, a little bit of a design classic and seeing it go up and down, I couldn't help but smile. Everybody else was looking at it going, uh? Someone no doubt has gone home today going, I'm sure, I'm sure today I saw a car driving around on four footballs. If someone's done that today, then my job here is done. And on that note, I hope that's been an interesting little look at a rather rare and oft forgotten car, the 1990 Fiat Panda Italia 90 edition. I want to say a huge thank you to John for bringing it out and if you'd like to know a little bit more about this car or if you've got one, join the register, make sure to check it out. It's fiatpanda.co.uk. And for everybody else, don't forget, hit that like button, comment down below if you haven't already, subscribe, hit the bell icon and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.